who in the audience um, is new to pandas? Awesome, cool. And who in the audience uses R? Oh, cool. All right, so I guess this is going to work out for everyone since it's um, I sort of wrote this talk sort of as a as an intro for both both sides. So um, I guess I will be sitting since I since this was a presentation that's no longer a presentation. Um, so everything's online because um, that's how it's on this computer right now. Um, so this is my Twitter handle and also my GitHub username. So you can also find all of this stuff there. Um, the data sets that I'm using are also in the repository, so you can, hopefully this works, that like everything is self-contained. So um, I'm Daniel, I'm a graduate student at Virginia Tech in the Genetics, Bioinformatics, and Computational Biology program. Uh, my lab is up here in Boston um, in the Social Decision Analytics Lab, even though my school is about five hours away from here. And I'm part of the Biocomplexity Institute of Virginia Tech. And for certain things more num-focused, PyData related. I am also one of the co-maintainers for the programming with R lesson um, through Software Carpentry. So uh, I sort of asked the question already, already but um, to reiterate or to extend on it, who uses both Python and R? Or, oh, nice. And then who hates the people who uses the other language? Anyone? <laughs> <laughs> no? All right. So Jake Vanderplas actually uh, sent a tweet uh, earlier last month or within the past month. And he pretty much just said that, yes, there's really no need for this fighting between languages. No one language is better than the other. I bounce around the two languages. And depending on what I need, um, I'll just do it in whatever language I feel comfortable in. And so just a little overview of the data sets I'm going to be going through. So there is an Ebola data set um, that was catered by um, someone that was in my program two years ago. Um, she curated um, an Ebola data set. So this is coming from the World Health Organization and a bunch of repositories. And she sort of created a central data repository during the uh, 2014 Ebola outbreak. So that's some of the data we'll be looking at. Uh, there's a survey data set that comes from the SQL Software Carpentry Library. And then we'll also use a cleaned up data set that Jen Jenny Bryan uses um, at the very end also. So Python. Um, some of you guys said that you're new to Python and just to, or new to pandas, but who is actually new to like Python like in general? All right, cool. Um, so if you start learning Python, and then you start realizing, hey, we can do data analytics in Python, uh, you're going to end up with like another wall where data analytics in Python is also, it's a little different than regular Python. There are certain idioms that if you just go in from the programming side, totally doesn't exist in uh, regular. Um, if you're going from the programming side, it doesn't happen, or those idioms don't really work in the data analytics side. and if you, there's a link to a talk that James Powell, which is also part, who is also part of um, PyData and NumFocus, on the differences on um, vernacular um, between the analytics side and the Python side. So if you're really new to Python, how do you get it? You use Anaconda. Uh, it's sort of the one place to get everything you need, um, at least in this PyData stack, um, except for this one library that I'll show you in a little bit. I've had a little problem with it. But, but how do you run it? So there's three ways, or there's, I've listed six ways you can run this. Um, you can type Python in a terminal, and you'll get a blinking cursor version of Python. You can type IPython in a terminal, and you'll get a more fancy blinking cursor version of Python. It's got a few, uh, it's got a few nice features with IPython, especially um, if you want to time your code. Timing is sort of built in. Um, let me make that a little bigger since people are scripting, yeah. And then there's, for those of you who are used to like IDEs, um, if you install Anaconda, Spider comes with Anaconda. Uh, Rodeo, which is built by Y Hat, there's a booth downstairs if you want to talk to them. They also have an IDE. And then there's another one that's pretty popular. I personally don't use it, but you can use PyCharm as well. So how do you use um, Python, or how do you use the analytics stack? 
the first thing you do is, so this is what you're looking at now, the Jupyter Notebook. So this is, if I go into a terminal and I type in Jupyter Notebook, this pops up. And to use pandas, you type import pandas as pd. So you import the data analytics, essentially um, pandas, which is a data analytics library, you import this in. And instead of saying pandas, calling each function by saying pandas.readcsv, for example, um, because you'll be using this uh, library over and over again, all the functions inside, you can short, you can give it like a temporary um, nickname called PD. So you'll see your code instead of pandas.readcsv over and over again, it'll be pd.readcsv and all the other functions that you need. And so we'll load up our first data set. It's, uh, we'll use the readcsv function. It comes from pandas, so it's pd.readcsv. And we'll look at the bullet data set. So this is pretty much a view that you would get just as if you opened it up in Excel or in a spreadsheet, it's a rectangular view. And you can call the function head just to get the first five, five rows. So you don't need to like lo look at a million rows, you just get the first five rows. If you are in the regular Python mode, so when you just type in pure Python, if you wanna get the output of something back, um, you have to wrap it around a print function. So print Ebola DF dot head will print out the same view. You just won't get it. It just won't look as pretty um, because of the interactive nature sort of pretty makes it pretty for you. So all right. So the first thing you do when you load up a data set, you want to see what's in here. So there are two pretty good convenience functions that Pandas has. Uh, info. Um, what it will do is it'll pretty much give you a bunch of information about the data view loaded, uh, the column names, how many non-missing values there are, and the type of um, column in there. So for example, you can see that uh, we have a date column. It's got 122 values. Uh, because there's 122 entries, we actually, there aren't any missing date uh, values in this column. And then its object, it's an, it has an object type, uh, which means that um, it's just a generic type, so it's really casted like a string. And you can see that there's other types like integers or floating point numbers, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see a list of all of the columns in this data set. Another way um, when you first load up a data set is to use the describe function. So what this will do is give you some pretty basic um, for, uh, statistics on what's going on in each column. So this is a pretty good way of just doing, you know, one-off things for everything, right? Like some of these might not make sense, especially if you have um, categorical variables, um, but, you know, this will give you a good count on mean and standard deviation of, of all your data. All right, so subsetting. Uh, there's a few ways you can subset in Python. So what you can do is have a data frame, use a square bracket, within the square bracket put in quotes the column that you want, and you'll get all of the data for that column. If it's really just one column that you're working with, you'll see a lot, um, a lot of code, um, especially on the internet. Um, instead of using the square bracket and then quotes, they'll just say data frame dot and then the column directly. So you'll, you'll see both, um, it's really like a convenience way, so you don't you kind of save about four characters of typing, but you'll see that around. If you need to subset multiple columns, you now have to give the subsetting, um, I guess, it's not really a function, but you have to give the subsetter um, a container of all of the columns that you want. So that's why you'll see two, two double brackets. Um, and then in here, in the innermost double bracket, I'll list all of the columns I want. So here I'm just looking for the day and the cases in Guinea. And I'll get two columns back instead of one. Now if you want to subset rows, um, actually, I'm still doing columns. So if you want to subset columns, instead of specifying by column name, you can also specify by the actual column number or the index, the position that it's in. Um, Python is zero index, so the first column is really index zero. So if I want the first two, it, I'm looking for zero and one. And if you're going for row-wise, instead of using uh, the plain square brackets, uh, there's three functions that you're gonna have to, that you'll see depending on where you uh, where you're looking, hold on, let me close all of this. There we go. So the first one is um, dot loc followed by a square bracket. And in here you get to specify the row that you want um, by the row name. So 
all of our row names, we didn't give them any special um, names really. So the row name is really the same thing as the row index in this example. But when you're working with time series data, it's actually pretty common to have like the date as the row name, for, for example. The next one is iloc, so you can use also um, same way, but you get to specify by the row number instead of the row name. And then you'll also see another way called IX, which is which will look by the name and then the number. So IX is really a more general way of, sp of slicing your data, but I'm sort of showing all three just for, um, I guess, for didactic purposes. Um, IX and all of the other subsetters I, I showed you, um, there's, a general f um, there's a general syntax where you have the outermost bracket and then within the outermost bracket, there's a comma that separates two parts. The part to the left, or the first part, that's how you would subset your rows. And a part to the right, that's how you would subset your columns. So if you're coming from R or Python, they're actually done exactly the same way. And then if you need to subset multiple rows or columns, you give in another container. And then you can subset that way. And if you also want, you can for example, take a column of your data frame out. So in this case, I'm looking at cases from Sierra Leone, and I'm saying I just want all the cases where, or all the rows where the number of cases is greater than 5,000. Because I'm using the IX um, subsetter, the left is how I'm subsetting the rows, and the right here is how I'm subsetting the columns. And what I get back are the date and cases Sierra Leone columns for all of the case, for all of the entries that have more than 5,000 cases. Right. And in Python, if you if you ever start, you know, pandas is a pretty fundamental package. So when you start using other libraries that are built on top of something that's a data frame, um, some you'll you'll end up getting errors like, hey, I'm expecting like an ND array and I didn't get an ND array, and you're like, well, well, I gave you a column, isn't that what you wanted? So if you ever get really confused of what's going on, there's a function called type um, that you can use in Python, and that will spit out exactly what that the type of that object is. Um, you can see here. This is the same thing as the first one. So I got a series object out. Um, in pandas, a series is really a column, and a bunch of columns or a bunch of series put together is, is what makes a data frame. Um, if you're working with some of like a, uh, a bunch of machine learning libraries or some other like optimi optimization libraries, um, they actually expect like an ND array. And the way to get a series, uh, an ND array out of a series is using the dot values um, property. All right, so creating new columns. Um, each data frame has an attribute called shape, so we can call shape on something and it'll give us a tuple or a container. Um, the first number will tell us how many rows, the second number will tell us how many columns. And if we want to, for example, make a calculation, we can say, hey, take the number of deaths from Guinea and add it to the column that represents number of deaths from Liberia, and we can directly assign it to another uh, column. All right, so if you need to make simple calculations with your columns, you can do so um, pretty direct. And if we look at the shape again, you'll see that the number of columns went from 18 to 19. Uh, missing values. So missing values are something that's missing and unknown. And for a lot of people who are new to data analytics, um, they want, how do you check for missing? You would expect a missing value is also equal to another missing value, uh, which and for all of, for any analytics library that you work with, NA or any missing value is never going to equal another missing value. Um, the way I think of it is this value is missing. It can really be anything. So you can't really, it can, all, it can be like the number 42 or 24, and you can't really say that those two values are going to be the same. So that's why missing values will always um, equate to false if you try to get some kind of truth value out of it. Um, in Python, the missing values actually come from another package called NumPy. And so it doesn't really matter how you, sp how you spell um, NAN, um, all three are exactly the same. And if you actually need to check for missing value, like if it's actually missing or has a NAN or not a number, uh, pandas has a function called isNull. And if you pass it that, it'll give you whether it is missing or not. Um, another way that you can also count for missing values is there, you can take data frame 
you can get the column out of a data frame and use a function called value counts. And instead of counting all the non missing all the non missing values, you can also say, hey, keep all the missing values and also tally those as well. And you'll get a count of missing values if that's what you need to do for your work. All right. How am I doing time? All right, combining data. So after you load in a bunch of data sets, um, typically either your data is you know, sharded across multiple files or you need to combine multiple data sets to create um, something that you can use to answer your question. So I have two data frames. Um, they look exactly the same. And depending on where you get your data from, you might want to concatenate your data row-wise. It could be, you know, this, this data set is really four million rows, and so they just broke it up into four files of a million rows each. And you need to assemble it back so you can actually do your work. So Pandas has a function called concat, and in concat, you can give it a list of all the data frames that you want stacked row-wise, and it'll just stack them row-wise for you. Likewise, if you want, you can um, stack them column-wise as well. So you can, all you do is the same function, and you provide the access as one, and it'll just stack it column-wise. Yep? Oh, yeah, so what? So the index, if you, so she was talking about the index, and you'll know what the index is because it's the only column that doesn't have a column name associated with it. Um, you should always have something there. And when you start concatenating row or column wise, the computer will try to actually match the index before it concatenates. Yeah, so if I, if for C2 I had A, B, C, E, for example, it will create a new column called E, and then all the Ds will be blank. So if that's, I don't know, uh, we can also talk offline. Yeah, yeah, we can also talk offline, um, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's just a blind stacking of your columns. Um, there's a... Uh, I think it, there's a parameter in here that will reset the index, so if you actually needed to go sequentially, on, like the numbers need to go sequentially, you can say, hey, like ignore the index, and it'll just stack it um, from zero to, I guess, I don't know, 10 or four or eight here in this example. But that's, that's just dummy index. I can still refer to the last row using seven. Uh, yes, if you, if you use the iloc subsetter, you can put in seven, and it'll give the last one. But if you use LOC, it'll look for the name, and seven doesn't exist, for example. Yes, yeah. So if you use, if you use, if you try to, even if you try to subset a column of A, it'll give you both A's if you stack it that way. Um, so another way, so this is just a blind concatenating your data. Um, Pandas also has ways of merging data sets. Um, so for example, in the survey data um, that I have, I have two examples. There is a survey visited data set and a site data set. And if we needed to combine these two into a single data frame, what we say is the we have two data frames. There's one on the left and one on the right. The one on the left is the first data frame that you are mentioning. That data frame has a function called merge, and you're merging it to another data frame on the right. And then how you specify um, what gets merged and how, you can call, there's a parameter called how, so this is um, outer, which means both sides will be kept. Um, you can also have something called inner, merge, inner joins, left joins, right joins, and that just depends on, you know, do I only keep the values that are contained in both or the left side or the right side? If your column names have different, uh, the column that you want to merge on have different names, you can specify a left on and a right on. And if you pass in a container, um, you can actually merge on multiple columns if you need to as well. All right, vector and group graphics. And grouped operations. So uh, for this example, I'll load in a Gapminer data set. And 
And let me try this. Let's say, for example, um, the example earlier when I created a new column was actually pretty simple. Um, it was directly based off of two existing columns doing a operation on it, um, doing like a I think I just, what did I do? I just added two columns together. Um, but let's say, for example, you have a column that you actually need to do you know, string parsing, something that you can't just add, use basic math operations on. Um, what you're going to have to do is sort of write a function that does all of the, the manipulations that you want. And then you can pass that function um, row-wise or column-wise. So let me break down this, uh, this a little bit. So I'm going to create a new column called life expectancy, life expectancy per capita. It's going to take the original um, data frame. And now there's a function called apply. And if you're coming from the R world, this is pretty much your, your life. But um, apply, what apply does, um, there's really like two main um, parameters that you need. The first parameter is a function that you're going to use. And then the second parameter, in this case, access says, do I, does this function that you pass it operate on every column or every row? And Right now, access is one, so it's working on every row. But if you leave it at default, the default zero, it'll work on every column. And I have this specified two different ways. Um, what I'm really doing is for each row, I'm getting the life expectancy value and dividing it by the population value. Um, you can see I specified this example like two different ways. Um, it's just to show you really they're both really the same thing. But I also am using. Um, I also found this out that pop is actually a Python like function for containers. So you can't really say x.pop. It's not really what that's asking for. So I, I wanted the pop column, not the function pop that takes the last element out of a, a container. So if you're not used to Lambda expressions, which when I was first starting out Python and this whole data analytics stack, um, you can also do the same thing I wrote up here in a simpler or in like a more traditional programming way, which is define a function that you want. And so I'm defining a function, and this function takes a row of data. Right? So that's the one assumption. I know this is going to be used in an apply function, so I can assume that it, an entire row is going to get passed in here. And then I'm doing the same exact calculation. I'm saying this row of data, give me the life expectancy divided by the population, save it to a a value and then return that value. And then the apply function here looks exactly the same as before. It's apply, but instead of this weird lambda expression that I just showed, uh, I just passed in that function directly, and then the axis is still the same. And just to prove to you guys that you know both of the calculations work exactly the same, um, is each value of the two columns I created all, all the same, and it's yes. So they really do work exactly the same way. And so what's really nice about you know, any really data analytics software, um, what really gives you insight into your data are grouped operations. Right? So here in our um, GapMiner data, let's say we wanted the average life expectancy and GDP per capita by each year. So we can take our data frame. There is a function called group by. We can group by the year column. So now all of the years are grouped together. From there, we're selecting the life expectancy and GDP per capita columns from the grouped data frame. And we're calculating the mean. And now this gives us a new data frame where um, for each year, we have all of the, life expect the average life expectancy and average GDP per capita. If you want, you can put another container here and group by year and continent or something, if that's what you want. Can I apply different operations on different columns? Yes. Uh, this mean part is, you know, you can really put any real, real calculation that you need. Um, no, like mean or life expectancy and max or GDP. Uh, yes, but I actually don't know that off the top of my head because I'm standing in front of you guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if it's max, if it's grouped, then you, you don't want like the max of everyone. You only want the max of a particular year. So you don't want, yeah. But, but yeah, you can totally use different operations as well. And then, oh no, import error. This is not good. 
Uh oh. <laughs> um, and last, the last example, just or oh, this obviously didn't work um, on my computer. Um, if you want to fit a linear model, for example, instead of pandas, you load up a library called scikit-learn. There is a function called linear model there. And the way you create a linear model is you, uh, Python is an object-oriented language, so you have to first create this object that's going to be a linear model. So you create the linear model object, and then you pass in, um, you call the fit uh, method from this object, and you give it all the data that you want fitted. So you have the, all the x's and all the y's um, from your data. It'll fit it, and then once it's fit, you can get the coefficients by running um, dot coef underscore, and it'll return all the coefficients that you need. Right? And so this was a slideshow, and uh, if you wanted to actually run a slideshow in the notebook, um, there is a package that uh, Tom Caswell over there mentioned to me yesterday uh, that Damien wrote called Rise, and you can install it by using con install Damien's um, channel and then Rise, and then uh, you'll get a nice little button up at, at your uh, in your notebook, and you can click it, and then depending on if you have slides or subslides, it'll render um, it'll render them for you that way. All right, still doing good. All right, so now we'll switch to the R side of things. So how do you get it? You can Google a letter, the letter R, which actually works remarkably. It's, uh, but the first few things you'll get, you'll probably get a link to the R project. Um, you can work your way down there to install R. And the IDE that pretty much everyone uses in R is R Studio. I personally, um, in here, I'm biased. I like using the preview version of RStudio just because you get kind of nice, cool bells and whistles um, before it's um, officially released, which usually takes like a few months. So you get to see some pretty cool stuff. Um, if you're on Conda, you can actually install R um, through Conda install dash C R and R, essential, R essentials. Um, and then what that also gives you, um, I think it's Aaron who works on like SymPy. He, he wrote the R Essentials uh, Conda installer. Um, he also wrap installs the R kernel for the notebook. So if you use R Essentials, you, have, you can actually, instead of using Python in your notebooks, you have the option to use R in your notebooks as well. So importing data. Uh, there's nothing to load. You're using R. It's a domain specific language just for analytics. So you really don't need to load anything to load data. And so there's a function called read.csv in R. So in R, periods really don't mean anything, or they, they do, but they don't mean, um, it's not what you think. It's really just part of um, the variable name, really. Um, you don't really need to use a period to say, hey, this is like a sub -meth a method of a class. So periods are allowed in variable names in R. Um, another gotcha in R, especially if you know you're, you see this read CSV file and then you use it, this read CSV function, you use it, it's great. Um, a lot of R programmers know that there's a parameter called strings as factors, uh, and you always set it to false. Uh, what happens is if you just use the default read CSV functions, if you have any columns that are strings, um, it gets converted into a factor in Python. In pandas, that's essentially what they've, they have a fairly new data type called a category or categorical variable. And so that's what a factor is. It's a categorical variable in terms of um, from the pandas world. And factors under the hood are actually coded as integers. So they're really one, two, three, four, five, six for, you know, or one and two for like male or female, for example, right? So if you start trying to do like string parsing on a factor, you'll find very quickly that nothing is doing what you're expecting. Um, you can, yeah, so just keep in mind under the hood is that it's really being coded as an integer. So just, you know, R, it stems from the fact that R has been around for a while and it came from a program called S. And the reason why it got coded into an integer is really just to save memory. But our laptops these days have enough memory that you know storing the strings is actually you know just to clean your data. It's just a lot easier just to work with strings. R is also, um, I would say, kind of like a weird language because uh, 
There's a man named Hadley Wickham, and he's actually made R really accessible to newcomers, but also changing everything there is about R. So it really depends on like when you learned R is how you will write R code. Um, I'm sort of in this world where like I use some of his packages and others not, and so like um, you'll you'll hear this thing in the R world called the tidyverse, which stems from you know this concept that Hadley um, wrote about about tidy data. And so if you want to use the tidyverse way of loading data, there are there are three packages essentially read R to read te uh, del delimited files. I can make this bigger or not. Or not. <laughs> uh, read R will read the limited files. Read Excel will read Excel sheets, and Haven to read um, stuff like SAS, SPSS, or Stata um, data. And when you use Hadley's packages, since everyone uses strings as factors as false, he just makes that the default for you, so you don't have to specify that. And Hadley uses underscores, so that's how you can kind of tell when you're in the Hadley world, uh, the Hadley or tidyverse world of things is. The periods are all gone, and you see underscores. Um, R also, unlike Python, doesn't have a um, what is it called? Like a namespace um, associated with it. It really is the order of the packages that you load. That is the that is the order of functions that when you call, that's what it will um, in that or in that order is what it will see first. So if you have two functions and two packages that have the same name. The last loaded package is that's the function it will use. If you need to force call a function, you will what you will do is you take the package that you're using or the, that you're looking or the package that you want, two colons and then the function, and then that's how you explicitly call a, a specific function. So I think within like one of Hadley's packages, there is a built-in method for mean. And so whether you want to use his mean function or base R's mean function, this is how you would specify which one is from which. And so um, in pandas, we had a, fun a, a parameter called shape. In R, we can use uh, dim for dimensions to see what the dimensions of our data are. And we get the same results back. Uh, first number represents rows, second, result second number represents columns. Um, just like uh, describe and info, we can take the summary of our data and it'll give us a bunch of summary statistics on our data frame. In R, if you want a subset, use a dollar sign. Um, if you want to subset a single column, you can also use a square bracket notation. So this looks like very similar to Python. If you want to subset multiple ones, um, it's the same thing as Python. You have to put in a container to, sub to specify multiple columns, but the way R specifies a container is um, the letter C, the function C, and then you list your elements in there. So you can think of C, the function in R, is like a list in um, Python. Is a yes. So this is uh, there is a comma at the start, and so the square bracket notation is the things to the left of the comma is how you subset rows. Things to the right of the comma is how you subset columns. So it's um, it's fairly similar syntax in that regard. And the other difference in R is R is one index, so the first column now starts with the number one, not zero. Um, if you're like me, or pretty much every programmer always is off by one, but depending for me, depending on what hour in the day I'm in R or Python, so like I really make this mistake like all the time that I'm that I have to check for. If you want to do something like Boolean subsetting, it's very similar to the Python syntax. You can say, hey, I want all of the cases from Sierra Leone. Give me those that are greater than 5,000. And then I only want the first two columns. And I'll return that value to you. Um, our Python will sort of drop the missing values by default. Um, R won't. So that's why you see a bunch of missing values here. Oh, say. All right, so in Python, I showed you, you can look at type, the function type, to see what you have. In R, that instead of type, it's called class. So you can take the class of something if you're ever confused of what type of object that you're getting. Um, especially when you're going, when you're working with the tidyverse um, set of functions, um, Hadley also essentially redefined what a data frame is. They're called tibbles. And so depending on what package you're using, it might only 
accept data frame objects and not tibbles. So if that's if it's something that like makes a lot of sense and you're confused what it is, um, why it's not working, you know, take the class of it just to see that you're actually passing the correct data type. Uh, just like in Python, if you're really getting one column of information, um, in Python you get a series back. Here you get essentially a set of integers. So um, everything is a vector in R, so this is an integer vector in R. Um, if you're subsetting multiple columns, by default you'll get back like data frame object. All right, so creating new things. Um, there is a package in R called MagGritter, and what MagGritter gives you is this um, not too carpal tunnel inducing of a uh, of syntax, um, but what it it's the pipe operator, and the way the pipe operator works is it takes the thing to the left, and that thing to the left gets passed in as the first um, parameter to the thing on the right. So you can pipe your um, you can pipe your commands or your your functions one into the other, and it plays really well into this whole tidyverse of things. Or if you're like me. Um, it saves me like a few keystrokes to go to the beginning of the line, type head, and then go to the end of the line, and then close the parentheses. So you can use that as well. If you load up some any of like Hadley's packages, MagRitter gets loaded automatically. So you pretty much um, you don't have to explicitly load um, this MagRitter packages for a pipe. But if you want to create new columns, it's very similar to the way you do it in Python. You can find a way to subset the column that you want and you can, if it's a simple operation, you can add the two columns together and it'll just do exactly what you expect. Right. Um, so um, there is um, the tidyverse way of creating new columns. So if you load up a package called dplyr, what you can do is you can take your original data frame, there's a function called mutate, and then you can specify the calculation that you want for um, creating a new column that way. And you can create multiple columns um, all in one go. What's also cool about mutate is you can, um, and in the same function call, use this uh, newly created column for another calculation if you want to as well. Uh, missing values are built into R. They're just capital N, capital A. And the way you check it, um, again, missing values are never equal to anything. So it's is.na for na, or is.null for null values. Uh, for combining data, so we can load up our data just like before. If you want to concatenate things row-wise, it's rbind for the r for row. And then if you want to concatenate column-wise, it's c for column, so c bind for columns. If you want to do merges, um, there is a base r function called merge. And just like in pandas, um, you have a left side and a right side. In this case, there's an x and a y. And you can specify different ways you want to merge that way. The tidyverse way, there is a function called full join or left join, right join, or inner join, and you can specify um, how you want to join data that way as well. One of the benefits, um, I guess this, I, I should be a little more explicit, uh, what's cool about dplyr is if you wrote this code out just like this, um, this is for a regular data frame that you loaded into R. Um, if you end up working, let's say this data gets so big that you need to dump it into a database, um, the rest of your code from whatever the first initial data frame, you can pass it the database connection and the rest of your code doesn't need to change. So it kind of will scale that way for you. It's smart enough to know that if you give it a database connection, it knows to work with the database and under the hood it'll write the SQL string for you and then query the database that way. Um, vectored operations, um, just like before there is a apply function um, just like in pandas, you give it the first the data frame that you want to apply on. Margin is similar to axes, so whether you want to ro work row-wise or column-wise, you specify one or two, and then the function that you want um, to use. So right here, I wrote the function just like I did in um, Python, like the lambda expression, where I wrote the function right there. If you want, you can also specify the function as its own function and then call the function directly right there. All right, so grouped operations, I use dplyr pretty much all the time. Um, Jared Lander, um, and there's a link to a YouTube video 
um, has performance metrics for base R and various other packages on how you can do aggregate statistics. This is really a table from his talk on what that looks like. And essentially, um, dplyr, RC, writing your own R, <laughs> C++ code to do a join uh, or group that aggregations, or there's another package called data.table are actually the, the quickest way of doing these. And the way you specify group operations is very similar to Python. It's, there is a function called group by, and then from within group by, you can calculate um, whatever you want, um, whatever group statistic that you need. And so in here, I'm just calculating the mean for both, but again, you can calculate min or max if needed. Uh, if you want to fit a model, there's really nothing special. There is a function for called LM for linear model, GLM for generalized linear model. Um, there's something called a formula syntax, so you can specify the Y and then the X, um, all, and you add more col um, more variables by add by having a plus sign. So if I wanted um, population, it'll be plus pop, um, and I can just add more um, co um, covariates to my model. If you want to look at my model, um, you take the summary of your model object and you'll get everything that you need. Uh, David Robinson, he works in, he work, he's a data scientist at Stack Overflow. Um, he gave a R talk about a package called Broom. And what Broom does is it sort of tidies or cleans up all your model objects. So what you can do is call the tidy function from Broom, give it your model, and it'll just give you a data frame of all of your, um, your model parameters if you need to. So it's a pretty good way of, pretty quick way of, you know, getting all the values that you need. Um, so here's some more things on tidyverse. Uh, I guess I'll just show you. And to make these slides, um, this was done in R Studio, but it's really using a package called uh, Knitter and R Markdown. And by default, if you use the GUI, it'll dump you some kind of YAML header at the top, and it'll generate slides like this as well. All right. I mean, how much more time do I have? Like a minute, really? Okay. All right. Is there seriously a minute? Okay, I can do this. All right, so I showed you how to um, work on um, R and Python. Has anyone heard of a package called Feather? All right, so there is a package called Feather, sort of like what Jake Vanderplus discussed. Um, Hadley Wickham, and so one of the prominent figures in R, and Wes McKinley, one of the prominent figures in Python, they're working together to make it so um, you can easily share data from R and Python, and it's a package called Feather. And in this repository, there's an example of, you know, using Feather to save out data from R, and then using Feather from Python to read it back in. And it's a lot, the whole point is this is a lot faster than reading out or writing out um, CSV files between your files. Uh, the only thing is it's really not made for prime time yet, so don't use it like if you're trying, like in a bank. Um, but if you're like, if you need to quickly send somebody a file, um, um, this is something that to look at out for in the future. Yeah, um, you can really name it like whatever extension, but I just called it dot feather. Yeah. And then if you want, there's a package called rpy2 that I really couldn't get working, but it lets you call R from within Python. So I'll sort of update this repository as I figure things out. But yes, that is my talk on someone else's computer. <laughs> yeah. Oh, how do you install R packages? In R, there is a function called install.packages. You give it, uh, and then a set of round brackets, and then in single quotes, the name of the package that you want. Yeah. Is there an easy way to install Python packages like you can with R, though? Conda. <laughs> yeah, so um, if you look at the last slide on my Python deck, I showed you like conda install okay. um, dash c Damien thing and rise. You, you just do, like, yeah, you can do conda install okay. like network x, and it'll for the most part you'll find it. Sorry, yeah. I do on that note. Sorry to interrupt. Can you go back to where you had the uh, import error in your psychic mode? Oh, I know what the problem is, but yeah. No, I just want to see. If, I, I'm just curious to see if this will work. Though. Oh, it, I I wasn't rendering it off a notebook or anything. I think this was a. Uh, no, I oh, pushed. So I, the yeah, I pushed changes that I shouldn't have pushed. <laughs> yeah, okay, I. It, it was quite a janky way to get this working because of RPY2. I had to like change my path 
for like a different slide deck. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's it's because I don't have it installed because I oh, took. I know, but you can, so so is this actually a live session? No, no, it's not. Yeah, it's a it's a static session. Yeah, yeah. which I will fix. <laughs> but yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah. No problem. All right.